Over the last couple of months, I've upgraded my Mac Pro 2010 to make it what I would call the ultimate Mac Pro 5,1. Here's a quick rundown, but if you've just come to see one part, skip to it using the timestamps in the description. I started by upgrading the W5680 Xeon processor I had to the X5690. That's the fastest available processor for the 5,1. I upgraded for two reasons. Firstly, my W5680 wouldn't work in a dual CPU configuration, and I intend to eventually upgrade to dual CPUs. Secondly, the clock speed of the X5690 is the fastest available on any 5,1, and for gaming, clock speed is important. I run games on Windows in my spare time on this machine, and I noticed a difference of 6% or under in all games. Very small, but noticeable, and that helps to prevent a bottleneck, for sure. As you can see, upgrading the CPU is very simple. You just slide out the CPU tray, take off the cooler, put the new CPU in, with paste obviously, and uh, put it back in. You do need a special long hex key to open the CPU cooler though. Performance with these Xeon chips is passable in 2023, for me at least. Mac OS runs absolutely fine and I didn't find myself slowed down at all during editing. Render times were slower than my 9th gen i7 machine, but not only is that to be expected, uh, but I can upgrade to dual CPUs eventually, if I see it as a big issue anyway. Gaming doesn't present a CPU bottleneck either. Every game I ran on Windows, bar simpler games like Minecraft to name one, ran with the GPU being the limitation. Next on the upgrade list, RAM. I got three 16GB sticks of HP 1333MHz ECC memory, which gave me 48GB of RAM running at triple channel speeds, which is the best thing to do to maximise your memory speed. Depending on your workflow, you may benefit from more memory instead of the speed, obviously, but I'm okay with just 48 gigabytes. Again, I slid out the CPU tray, popped out the old sticks, and put the new ones in. These Macs have lights on the board to alert you if one of your sticks isn't pushed in properly or isn't working. I saw no improvement in gaming from upgrading the RAM, but if you use editing software regularly or open a lot of programs, or indeed both, it's worth doing. I'd recommend getting used server memory from eBay as it's pretty cheap, especially if you buy in big amounts. Next up, graphics. It's a bit complicated, so I'll keep it short. I got the Mac with a Mac flashed R9 280. Until recently, I'd been using a GTX 1080, but recently I found I wanted to run Mac OS as well as have a boot screen. I bought a card from Mac Vidcards EU, who were based in Poland. They custom flashed GPUs to run native boot screens in classic Mac Pros, for a price, that is. I got the AMD RX 6600 XT 8GB Power Color Fighter Edition. This turned out to be the perfect graphics card. It's tiny, so it leaves a lot of room for airflow in the case, and doesn't block other PCIe lanes. The power consumption is also surprisingly low, with a max consumption of 160 watts. Performance is really good in mine and others' experience. The 6600 XT is about as good as a 1080 Ti, which is just a few percent worse than a 3060 Ti. It runs macOS Monterey a treat, and since I edit all my videos using it, the GPU is a nice help. Or one of this power, anyway. Here you can see Star Wars Battlefront 2 running at 1440p max settings. I'm locked in at 80fps, which is the most my monitor can support, really. Next up, Fortnite. 1440p high settings here, which it runs fine with. I was mostly locked at uh, 80 FPS, but as you can see, when I'm in busier areas, 70, even high 60s. Metro Exodus, I had to scale down to 1080p actually. Max settings, with ray tracing off that is, run fine, but I think 1440p is a bit of a struggle with the 8GB of VRAM on this card. Spider-Man Remastered was a similar story, but I did run it at 1440p because I like to get all the high quality visuals on the uh, Spider-Man games. I saw frame rates in the high 50s here, which, if I'm honest, is perfectly playable. Next up, OS and storage. I've got macOS Monterey 12.6.7 running on a 500GB NVMe drive with a PCIe adapter. macOS recognises the SSD just fine, and I've got really fast boot times thanks to it. Yeah, I definitely recommend this upgrade if you can go with it. Performance on macOS was brilliant, and uh, as you can see I'm shifting big files and moving along a high quality video with no loading or wait times. This footage is 1080p60 and I occasionally work with 4K, which is just as smooth to view and move. Now that SSDs are going down quite quickly in price, I'd recommend you get as big an SSD as you possibly can. 
there's actually seven storage bays in my uh, Mac Pro. I've got one NVMe drive, four SATA drives, and two SATA drives in the space where the DVD drive normally would be. I like to physically label my drives as it makes me feel organised, and it kind of looks cool too, to be honest. By the way, I use two hard drives for uh, Windows and two for Mac OS, generally speaking. My next upgrade is the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi card, but before that I thought it best to clean some of the filth that had accumulated in my computer over the years before I bought it. Once that was done, I started to remove the old Wi-Fi and Bluetooth components from my computer. I unplugged the old Bluetooth card, unscrewed it, and removed the Wi-Fi antenna card as well. Then I started work on the Wi-Fi card. There were quite a few screws on it, and I also had to unplug it and unplug all the antenna cables from it. I then put in the new antenna, which was connected to one of those PCIe mounting brackets. This new antenna supposedly has far better range, as well as more stability, than the old one. By the way, I got this kit from a site called Intriguing Industries. The site sells a lot of Wi-Fi adapters for uh, MacBook Pros, Mac Minis, and also Mac Pros, obviously. This one cost me £40, and then the Wi-Fi card itself I got from eBay for about 30 Back to the installation, I needed to line up all the antenna cables before I plugged in the new airport card. Once that was done, I plugged it into the port where the Bluetooth card was before, and made sure the antenna cable ran smoothly from the airport card to the antenna itself. Sorting out these cables was a bit of a pain, but as long as the CPU and RAM tray goes in fine, I think you're fine. This airport upgrade was by far the most useful. Windows worked fine with Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, and there were a lot of benefits I got in macOS from having the newer card. I can now AirPlay from my iPhone to the Mac. Content from YouTube runs fine, as well as music, which is brilliant. I love the little AirPlay icon you get when you're playing something to your Mac. Also, AirDrop's really useful. I use it in my editing workflow to get the footage from my iPhone to my Mac. As you can see, it now works fine. Continuity features like handoff and uh, copying and pasting from one device to another work fine as well. If you're making any upgrades to your Mac Pro, I'd suggest you think about doing this one first. It really modernizes the whole machine and introduces some really useful features. The last upgrade to my setup is something separate altogether from the Mac. I got a 1440p display to view games and create content on, and there truly is no going back from the 1080p screen I used to use. I paid only £52 thanks to someone on eBay selling this Dell UltraSharp without a stand. The full model name is U2719D if you're interested. Considering that price, I think it would be stupid not to get one. If you're viewing lots of video or games on your computer, that is. Considering the price most of these are going for, I think this computer is still great value in 2023. That's about all I've got on it for today. Uh, let me know if you enjoyed the video, leave a like, subscribe for more, and I'll see you next week. Also, my first decent video was on this Mac Pro a few months ago, so if you're interested, check that out for more.